located in the middle of eastern Antarctica, a strange, oval-shaped structure, measuring 400 feet across may be one of the ultimate pieces of evidence that ancient civilizations once roamed Antarctica. Talk about ancient civilization inhabiting Antarctica has existed for decades. What if, in the distant past, when Earth in Antarctica, was much different than today, an ancient civilization developed there, creating fascinating structures, monuments and temples there? Would we find evidence of their existence today? Curiously, there are numerous ancient maps that depict parts of Antarctica free of ice. One of the most controversial maps was without a doubt composed in 1513, by Turkish Admiral Peri Reis, who drew a map that would create a global debate over 500 years after him. The map depicts Antarctica, which was discovered between 1818 to 1820. But how is this possible? It has become a popular belief that ancient civilizations across the globe were in fact much more advanced than what mainstream researchers are crediting them for. Numerous maps discovered in the past are clear indications that the story told today by scholars is incomplete, and there are numerous missing links in our history. These missing links are being put together by these incredible ancient maps that prove mankind inhabited our planet much longer than what mainstream scholars believe. Perhaps these ancient maps, in combination with modern satellite images of our planet are the ultimate evidence that civilization could have developed in the most inhospitable places on Earth in the distant past. According to numerous indicators, such structures have already been identified in recent years. Satellite imagery of the Antarctic continent has revealed several structures that are spread across the icy continent. While some of them can easily be explained as natural geological formations, there are some discoveries that question everything we know about Antarctica. Whether or not these structures are man-made, and are evidence of lost ancient civilizations inhabiting Antarctica is hard to tell, and unlikely according to mainstream scholars. However, there are numerous discoveries that point otherwise and suggest that we need to look at things from a different perspective. In 2012, a satellite image of Antarctica spotted a strange oval-shaped formation in one of the most remote places on the planet. Thousands of miles from society, the strange oval-shaped structure raised numerous questions among experts. At 400 feet across, experts analyzing the image ask whether or not this structure could be the result of Mother Nature. The unusual shape of the structure suggests it may be man-made formation. Observing the image, we immediately notice how the rings of the structure resemble a structure in ruins, as if we were looking at walls that have been destroyed, collapsed ruins that have been covered by snow and ice. The image taken in 2012 clearly resembles something that may easily have been designed by someone. But designed by whom? The structure is located in the middle of Antarctica, one of the most inhospitable places on the surface of the planet, one of the most remote and untouched places on Earth, eastern Antarctica. While the structure may be a man-made structure, experts have to consider a natural explanation. A bizarre ice formation created heavy snowfall, low temperature, and Antarctica's freezing catabatic wind. Experts believe that what satellites spotted over eastern Antarctica may be oddly shaped as drudgy sharp irregular grooves formed on a snow surface by wind erosion. Snow slash ice dunes. However, sas drudgy run parallel to the direction of the wind. Several times, they all saw rapidly moving silver disks over the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. Brian and his crew also saw a huge football field-sized hole in the ice only about five to 10 miles from the geographic South Pole that was supposed to be a no-fly zone. But during an emergency medevac crisis to speed up their trip, they flew across that no-fly zone and saw apparently what they were not supposed to see. A huge hole in the ice that looked like it was an entrance to an underground installation. Later at camp near Marie Birdland, some dozen scientists disappeared for two weeks. When they reappeared, Brian's flight, Brian's flight crew was assigned to pick them up and all were silent and appeared scared. Brian and his C-130 crew received orders to not talk about the silver disks or the huge ice hole or the missing scared scientists. Repeatedly, the crew was sternly told that they did not 
see what they kept seeing. But Brian was never asked to sign an official non-disclosure agreement. So now that he's retired from the Navy while still working in civilian aerospace, Brian wanted to share what he has seen and experienced with me at Earth Files because he is convinced that an alien presence is living and working on this planet. We had never met until Thursday evening, June 2nd, 2016, at the Contact in the Desert Conference in Joshua Tree, California. We organized to meet with his nephew, Kelly, and a friend to talk about Brian's Antarctic experiences. We all went to a local Mexican restaurant, and after dinner, we kept talking until after midnight outside in the restaurant parking lot under trees. That weekend, while I was still doing lectures, workshops, and panels at the contact conference, Brian returned to his home in Phoenix, Arizona. On Monday, June 6th, he was back at his aerospace job, which he has always kept confidential. I don't have a number there to call him because he wants to keep his job protected. But that morning, Brian received a surprising and disturbing phone call that he describes now. The voice on the other end of I was back at work on Monday after the conference and my cell phone rang about 10.30, quarter to 11 in the morning. And the voice on the other end of the line said, is this Brian? And I said, yes, is this? Because I didn't recognize the number.
Amundsen Scott Station showed a pyramid and, quote, other spectacular ruins and things they could not go into, close quote. Allegedly, Navy SEALs came in one or more helicopters to take objects away. Officials of the U.S. Naval Support Task Force in Antarctica denied the story and said the Navy did not possess any video shot by the missing Alliance's TV crew. But at the same time, there was another U.S. legal action in 2002 to block the release of a hardcover book entitled Raising Atlantis by Tom Greenius, a novel based on fact. The book is about a secret U.S. military expedition that discovers ancient ruins two miles beneath the ice in Antarctica. The government allowed the first e-book version in the spring to be released with sensitive information about U.S. underground continuity of government installations, but blocked the hardcover release until the sensitive information was deleted. Could that big ice hole that Brian and his C-130 Navy crew saw near the South Pole in 1995 and the later incident in early 1996 of the missing National Science Foundation scientists be linked to the 2002 Atlantis Mapping Project news release about the missing documentary crew and videotape of pyramids and other structures beneath the ice? If the U.S. government is trying to cover up the discovery of pyramid and other structures two miles below the ice near the South Pole in Antarctica, the secret would be revolutionary, because the last time the entire Antarctica continent was free of ice is generally considered to be about 15 effort.
from and then try deliberately to intimidate. I don't know what we can do. If the government says it's not going to happen or shut up, that's what happens. I think people just have to come forward and tell what they know. It's like one person stands up in a crowd and says, no, I'm not going to do it. And you know what? Somewhere in that crowd, there are other people that feel the exact same way. And if one more person stands up and one more person stands up, pretty soon you've got a crowd and we need to get back into that kind of mindset and make the government serve us and not us serve the government. Brian, would you please read the email that you sent to me? Okay. Linda, I was listening to your reporting, Bill Tompkins, and his knowledge about the alien races and the agendas they are attempting to carry out. I started to realize the things that my father had told me in his ending years of life that now made total sense to me. His account of the times during World War II flying bombing missions over Germany. The Balls of Light, which he called Foo Fighters, is two missions that he thought he and his crew were not going to make it back from Germany because his plane had been shut up so badly, flying only on two engines. And when he thought that everything was lost, he told me that he turned to his co-pilot and there sitting between them was the image of Christ. He told me that Christ put his hand over his hand on the throttles of his B-17 and pushed him up to full power. This next thing my dad then said is what he was engulfed in a white light so bright he could not see anything in the cockpit of his bomber. And then the next instant, his plane was over the English Channel and he had lost several hours of time. As my dad was telling me about this mission, he was upset and crying. I've never seen my dad ever cry before in my life. Until the day my dad died, he would not say any more about that mission. He would tell me about his other missions flying over Germany as many times as I wanted to hear them. That one, only once, did he talk about. That mission, I believe, was one of the Foo Fighter encounters he had, and his crew may have been abducted and then returned to the aircraft just before the plane reached England. Our family lineage is Nordic and Norwegian and goes back to the Viking clans. My dad's side of the family are all blue-eyed blondes and my mom's side is German descent. Well, your guest Bill Tompkins was telling me about Nordic reptilian connection and some of the Nordic type alien species has me wondering if my family is involved with that somehow. My dad also talked about his dreams of what he called reptile men during his time flying missions over Germany. He would laugh that off and say that he probably read too many comic books as a kid, but I think it scared him, and he had encounters also with the reptilians during one or more of his flights over Germany. I think all this means something, and hearing Bill Tompkins has triggered a better understanding of things that have happened. Bill Tompkins, who Brian is referencing, is now a 93-year-old retired aerospace engineer and author of a recent book entitled Selected by Extraterrestrials, My Life in the Top Secret World of UFOs, Think Tanks, and Nordic Secretaries. Mr. Tompkins' extraordinary life included flying all over the United States in the 1940s to secret sites at Lockheed, Northrop, Douglas, and other aerospace companies and top universities that were doing secret work for the United States Navy. In May 2016, I did an interview with him for my news website, earthfiles.com. Bill Tompkins told me as a young man in early 1942, he was inducted into the U.S. Navy where he was asked to make scale models from photographs of extraterrestrial aerial craft the various corporate Navy contractors had learned about through government intelligence operatives that included Nazi SS manufacturing of anti-gravity spacecraft. Tompkins also learned that behind Adolf Hitler in the Second World War, there were two different species of reptilian humanoids. One included what he called Dracos from the Draco constellation about 12 light years from Earth, 
and known as a satellite of our own Milky Way galaxy. According to Bill Tompkins, Navy intelligence learned that humanoid reptilians from the Draco constellation were manipulating Hitler 